CEO of CRISPR Therapeutics. Thanks for joining us today, Sam. Thank you for having us, Maury. So we're going to do a fireside chat format. And um, if anyone in the audience has questions, feel free to email me. Um, but maybe to start off, Sam, if you want to give a brief intro to CRISPR to those who may not be familiar with the story. Happy to do that, Maury. Uh, and nice to speak with everyone. Um, CRISPR Therapeutics is a company based on the on access to the revolutionary CRISPR technology, which you all saw won the Nobel Prize in chemistry this year. Um, very early on, um, we recognized the potential of this technology uh, to revolutionize medicine, and uh, we set up CRISPR Therapeutics with the with the goal of creating transformative therapies for serious diseases like sickle cell disease, thalassemia, cancers, uh, and even more common diseases such as diabetes, where we can have a serious impact. <clears throat> In the um, five years after starting a brick and mortars establishment and setting up our operations in Boston, we've moved very quickly and are at the cutting edge of this uh, wave of cell and gene therapies, uh, where we brought a number of programs to the clinic. We currently have four different programs in clinical trials across six different indications, uh, and we're progressing all of them rapidly. Uh, we were very encouraged last year when we showed the first glimpse of data uh, for sickle cell and thalassemia, <clears throat> uh, where we showed that the first patients treated with uh, our CTF001 medicine um, showed a tremendous benefit uh, and show showed hints of a potential cure uh, after treatment with CTF001. We have since followed up with data at uh, EHA conference uh, earlier this year, uh, and uh, we'll have data at ASH, <clears throat> which um, show show the you know the that this medicine CTX001 can be um, the the uh, curative approach, but also best in class within uh, these indications. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about it, but we also showed data for our from our immuno-oncology trials with our CTX110 program, which looked very promising. I'm happy to dive into those. But overall, uh, as a company, we've grown dramatically in the last five years uh, to set up uh, preeminent capabilities. We've brought a number of programs to the clinic with promising early data. We have a number of additional data disclosures coming up, uh, one almost every few months over the next two years, uh, and are set up nicely to um, to to advance not one but multiple programs, hopefully um, through the registration, and ultimately provide that to patients uh, where there's great unmet need. Great overview. And um, for CTX01 and beta thal and sickle cell, um, maybe if you can just talk a little bit more about the approach there and recap data that's been uh, reported so far with the latest cut at EHA. Yeah, happy to do that. I think um, you know one of the big advantages of CTF001 is it relies on nature's mechanism. The underlying thesis for our approach in treating thalassemia and sickle cell is to overcome the defectiveness or deficiency of the beta globin gene, which is a subunit of adult hemoglobin, by elevating fetal hemoglobin. We're all born with fetal hemoglobin. But through nature's own mechanism, fetal hemoglobin is turned off about six months after we're born and replaced with adult hemoglobin. It turned out in many population studies that there were families around the world that had a naturally occurring mutation where the fetal hemoglobin was never turned off. And even though they had the genetics of sickle cell or thalassemia were asymptomatic or normal. We're basically leveraging nature's mechanism or this finding in nature to recapitulate or those mutations that were observed in nature to elevate fetal hemoglobin or simply turn the switch back on on fetal hemoglobin. And when you do that, uh, the fetal hemoglobin overcomes, um, in, in the case of thalassemia, the deficiency of beta globin or adult hemoglobin. And so patients are not anemic anymore and don't require transfusions. And in the case of sickle cell, the fetal hemoglobin is uh, prevents the formation of sickle-shaped cells, which would prevent, you know, pain and uh, and uh, vasoclusive crises that the patients face. 
Got it. Yeah, I think that's great insight. And um, maybe talk about the the data so far. And then also, um, uh, Ash Abstracts came out, and in there we saw that uh, there's five beta cell patients that remain TI. Um, early patients for three months, and then the oldest ones out to 15 months, and then for 12 months and three months for the two sickle cell disease patients who are free of uh, VOCs. And so how meaningful is uh, this follow-up time? Yeah, uh, thank you. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit, you know, in terms of the data, I'll speak chronologically just to, uh, so the audience can understand how this all played out. Um, last November, we disclosed data for the first thalassemia and the first sickle cell patient that we had treated with CTX001. The first thalassemia patient was a 19-year-old female who had, you know, lived a life with serious thalassemia, required a number of transfusions, uh, um, more than one a month, and had other comorbidities associated with the disease. So quite serious disease. And this patient was then treated with CTX001, and the treatment process is one where we collect the cells from the patient, send it to our manufacturing facility, um, make the CRISPR edit, send the cells back, and then in a you know the patient is undergoes conditioning regimen or for a transplant, and then the patient is transplanted uh, with our cells. And this patient, you know, after a couple of months of treatment with CTX001, has been transfusion independent. Uh, and that's what Maury was referring to as TI, transfusion independence. And for all intents and purposes, it's a functional cure for this patient because you don't need transfusions to have basic oxygen transport in the body. Um, <clears throat> so we were very excited to see that result. There, there were questions that remained about whether are you going to see this across all patients in th thalassemia, especially because they have many different mutations that cause thalassemia. And is this going to be durable? Because in gene therapy, you've seen some of the effects not be durable. Um, and similarly, you know, we had this, this same effect in, you know, in sickle cell disease, where a 33-year-old woman at the time uh, with, with, with three children was, um, was living a life of pain and serious sickle, disease, sickle cell disease, had a number of hospitalizations per year of coming into the trial, and was treated with our therapy. And we saw the fetal hemoglobin go up after we, she was treated with CTX001 and has been VOC free since that point um, of being treated with CTX001. So I think I, I think for both of the patients, it was a dramatic and um, effect on their course of disease and, and their normal life. Um, and again, the same questions were, do you see that with other patients? So now with the data that we have in the ASH abstract a year later, what we show is the same trajectory of fetal hemoglobin elevation is seen across all the thalassemia patients that we've shown. That's that's for five different thalassemia patients with different genotypes. And then we see the second sickle cell patient have the same trajectory on a fetal hemoglobin level as the first one, which points to the fact that this therapy can be consistent across all patients. And you know, for the first patients treated, we've gone off quite far now in durability with the follow-up of, of um, getting on the thalassemia patient, we're getting close to two years, um, and the sickle patient well past a year, and the effect seems to be durable. So I think, you know, while we obviously want to enroll more patients um, to complete the trial and, and go to the regulators for, for to, register, to, to file for registration, um, we feel very good about the data we see so far and in what could be a best-in-class product in the space. Got it. And, and so you talked a little bit about the, the number of patients and I think with consistency and durability, I think that helps build a strong case uh, for the therapy. So when you go to FDA, um, I guess, uh, are your thoughts on having 45 patients per trial, is that still the number that you think would be sufficient for approval or do you think it could be less than that? Well, uh, we designed a trial uh, for up to 45 patients, not knowing what the effect is going to be. Um, but if, if we see almost every patient reach transfusion independence and almost every sickle patient becoming VOC free, I think an argument can be made that we don't need to see it for the effect in 45 patients. It could be a smaller number. Uh, in fact, you've seen 
Bluebird get a European authorization with a much smaller number than that for thalassemia. Um, so with that in mind, I think we would be discussing these aspects with the regulators as we dose more patients and disclose more data to see what that number is in terms of uh, per trial and what duration you need to observe them for. And, um, you know, if the data continue to play out the way uh, we see so far, I think you would, you can make a strong case for having a smaller cohort of patients as sufficient for the registrational data set. Got it. And are you putting a number on that or not at this point? Well, I think, you know, we need to have, you know, one of the uh, great benefits we have for the program is that we have prime and RMAT designation now. And uh, that allows us to have very easy discussions with the regulators and, and, um, and I think that that gives us that ability to have an ongoing dialogue. But I think until you get to a certain point with the data um, and your um, and everything else that goes with the trial in terms of CMC, et cetera, um, you know, you, you're then in a position where you can have that discussion and dialogue. Got it. And I know you can't say much else about what's going to be at ASH because of embargoes, but um, can you provide any general thoughts on uh, uh, whether we should be looking for additional details on editing efficiency, bone marrow engraftment, et cetera? Um, I think we, typically in these medical meetings, we do provide a little more information. Um, I think our, our presentations in terms of what information we provide for these patients will be consistent between uh, EHA and ASH. Um, so you will get some of these details uh, around each of the patients and their uh, editing levels and fetal hemoglobin, et cetera. Great. Okay. And then for the studies, can you tell us how many patients have been dosed and should we um, expect additional updates in first half of 2021? Yeah, I think we'll provide, uh, we'll provide the updates on where we stand with the trial um, at ASH. And, and then, you know, at some point next year, we'll provide guidance around regulatory path and uh, when we may be able to uh, have full clarity on what's required for registration. Great. And um, uh, for the competitive landscape, we've talked a little bit about this in the past too. And um, we talked about Blue uh, and they've, they've generated some good long-term data. Maybe if you can just provide um, your latest thoughts on the competitive landscape and um, and how your approach is differentiated and, and how the treatment paradigm could look. Yeah, I think, um, you know, kudos to Bluebird for bringing their program to this level and they kind of were the early pioneers in even thinking about sickle cell and thalassemia with gene therapies. Um, I, I think, you know, as you look at the programs, you may end up very well end up with two programs that have very good data for these patients, which is a good thing. I think, you know, patients with sickle cell have been ignored for a long time. I think there's more than one option. It's it's certainly to the benefit of society and the patients and society. Um, I think that said, I think, you know, um, given the latest updates on timing for filing from Bluebird, you know, I think um, the gap between them and us may not be as wide as people had originally imagined in terms of getting to the market. Um, and so you may have end up having two, two uh, programs to kind of get there within a short time span of each other. And then uh, both companies will need towards, to work towards market development. I think one of the key things here is market development. You need to have uh, do a lot of work with the patient advocacy groups, with uh, with hematologists to inf to educate them on therapies like this, and uh, so they fully understand the risk reward, and uh, set up for a good launch. And I think uh, our efforts can be complementary across the two companies. To your question of differentiation, you know, I think one of the things that we have a big advantage on, over is the fact that CRISPR is a scalpel like approach versus a shotgun approach with gene therapy you know i think our manufacturing is simpler you know the the cmc requirements may be uh lower than what gene therapy may have and ultimately i think we don't have the notional safety risk that gene therapy has 
or retroviruses have of, of random integration into the genome. And CRISPR is much more precise in its scalpel-like approach. And so that advantage will play out uh, and the notoriety and and um, the, the breadth of understanding of CRISPR and the excitement around it will also provide us tailwinds that position as well. And then from a program perspective itself, you know, we have to, it's too it's too early to compare the data apples to apples, but you'll have to look and see at what the fetal hemoglobin levels are relative to TA7Q, you know, um, what sort of um, um, how quickly you get to those levels of protect protection. And uh, all those may end up being things where we have an advantage in the long term as well. Got it. Yeah, I think those are all key points. And um, uh, our perception is that for your studies with O1, it seems like enrollments picked up. Um, is that is that accurate? And can you comment some on uh, potentially some of the underlying drivers for that? Yeah, I think I think there's been tremendous excitement and interest in being part of the program. So I think enrollment, even in the COVID environment, has not been challenging. Um, there are a number of sites that are interested as well as patients across the globe, uh, not just in the U.S. And um, uh, we'll provide updates on enrollment and the progress of the trial as we go along. Um, I think the, um, the, the, we've navigated COVID nicely in, in terms of using our manufacturing slots. We did slow down dosing for a period of time, but we're back at full pace now, and I think the program will pick up a lot of momentum, especially as we get more data out there and more news articles are written about it. Got it. And um, I think we, we've got to uh, move on to the off-the-shelf CAR-T programs where you've had some uh, impressive initial data recently uh, from your CTX110 CD19 program. So can you quickly summarize the, the data for the investors uh, on the call who may have missed it? Yeah, I, you know, just to contextualize what what this pro these programs are, you know, we've seen dramatic results with autologous CAR Ts for patients that didn't have any options, you know, in lymphoma, multiple myeloma, and the last line. We've seen patients now survive, you know, two years when they had a death sentence of six months with these autologous CAR Ts, and. The data are great, but it has been hard to scale commercially and get it to a lot of patients because of the challenges of autologous CAR-Ts. And what we're doing is allogeneic CAR-T by taking healthy donor T cells, engineering them to attack these cancers, but this can be off the shelf because it's done as one manufacturing step for hundreds of doses versus doing it on a personalized basis as in autologous CAR-Ts. Um, you know, just three years ago, just with all, all this in perspective, we had talked to um, a big pharma company about allogeneic CAR Ts, and they said, you know, it'll take at least a couple of Nobel Prizes to to make allogeneic CAR Ts work. And you know, just a short time period thereafter, here we are. Okay, we have three different CAR Ts in the clinic, and with our CTS one ten data, while it's early. At dose level three, we had half the patients have a complete response. Um, I, I think you know the. Uh, I, I think uh, it's important to recognize how quickly all this has moved. Three years ago, editing efficiency in T cells was five percent. That was state of the art, and we made it fifty percent through a number of engineering steps. We've now gone from the ability to edit one or two genes to ten genes now at manufacturing scale with CRISPR, uh, and we've moved all these programs in the clinic, and the early data are very encouraging. And I just think this is gonna build on itself over time because, um, you know, we, we still have a question of whether these, these responses are durable, and we need to see that, but the fact that these, the responses were dose dependent, the fact that um, they were generally safe until DL3, and, uh, and the fact that you can redose with these therapies gives us a big advantage over autologous therapies, and in fact, a big advantage over uh, even bispecifics because bispecifics, you know, have lower improvement potential relative to allogeneic therapies. 
once you have a chassis with allergenic therapies, you can make more edits. And I bet the next version of the next version is going to be better and better. And every three years, we'll have a new version come out just like iPhones and Samsung. Um, and they're, they're going to be based on what you see in the trials and they're going to be better than the last one. And, um, I have firmly believe that allogeneic cell therapies are going to be frontline therapies in, uh, heme malignancies and potentially even in solid tumors. Got it. Yeah. And maybe talking about some of the, uh, technical observations that you've seen with, um, 110 for, um, peak T cell expansion. I don't know if you can provide any more perspective on, on what you're seeing there. And uh, with your particular approach, you've got the uh, B2M knockout, and it's a mix of uh, uh, cells that are mostly B2M knockout, but you also have some that have B2M intact. Mm -hmm. So maybe if you can talk about a little bit more about that as well. Yeah, happy to. I think I think what we saw, you know, it's very important to track the pharmacokinetics of these T cells to understand how allogenic CAR Ts are working. Now, there's an assumption that allogenic CAR Ts will work the same way as autologous CAR Ts, but it may or may not be true. Uh, but what we're learning so far is, you know, there is uh, dose dependent expansion. You know, you know, as we go to higher doses, the you know the the peaks that you see around day ten for these cells seem to be higher with higher doses. Okay, which makes sense because if you saw dose dependent responses, but but you didn't see a greater number of T cells at higher doses or CAR Ts at higher doses, it wouldn't make sense. So you are seeing dose dependent. Uh, peaks with these with these CAR Ts, um, and what's remarkable is you're seeing that these CAR Ts seem to persist for a long time. And uh, the beta two M edit, the thesis behind the beta two M edit was that that would prevent the host T cells from eliminating these CAR Ts, mm -hmm. and that you would have longer persistence. And um, while they're not at high levels later on, but they certainly seem to be detectable. Well, well far out, you know in the first one of the patients it was six months out um where we had the data to the longest extent and uh so we'll learn more about you know how the expansion kinetics correlate with different tumor you know different tumor types in the long run but also within with tumor burden and with uh, other patient characteristics and also with responses um, and we hope to put all that together when we present data the next time around and make a major medical meeting. Got it. And uh, for those, the cells that were detected six months out, so those are B2M cells, and that's from a blood sample from the patient. Uh, we haven't disclosed the, the, the ratio of the beta to M positive versus beta to M negative cells when we said they're detected far out. Uh, we are collecting all that data. It's, it's, you know, when you, um, you need very sensitive assays to detect that distribution, but our hypothesis is, uh, they'd be the beta to M negative cells that, that persist that far out. Got it. Interesting. And, um, maybe another technical question. What are your thoughts on, uh, B cells and their involvement with this approach? Um, is that something that you guys are interested in? And, um, uh, it'd be great to hear your insights. You mean B cells as a, as a vehicle as synergistic with T cells in killing cancers, or do you mean B cells, uh, as in, as, as they come back, uh, after B cell plasia? After B cell plasia, yeah, yeah, I think I think those are all all things we're we're looking into, um, and I think you know in, in the autologous CAR T setting, obviously, uh, B cell plasia was an important marker to see how durable the effect is, um, and so we're tracking that with our with our therapies um, and um, understanding of it as we go along. Got it. Okay. Um, and based on what you've learned so far, um, are there any adjustments that you're planning on doing to this study uh, in respect to conditioning regimen um, or doses at all? Yeah, you know, um, it's a good question. I think it's a question we asked ourselves after we saw the data, which is, do we need to do any changes? And after a lot of thought, we, we, we don't think we need to make any changes here. I think what we have are very encouraging uh, responses. Um, if you think about it, 
you know, there were, there's been this misconception a little bit that uh, the patients in our trial may not be as serious or as sick, but it's actually the contrary. I think compared to other data disclosures, um, our patients are probably, they're all DLBCL and they actually are sicker patients. Um, they have fewer lines of therapy because there's no options for these patients, you know, relative to less serious uh, tumor types where there's greater number of lines of therapy available. Um, and in these very sick patients, you saw very encouraging responses at, with the lymphodepletion that we have and, and with the, the uh, dose levels that we have for our CAR-Ts. So at, at this point, I think we just want, you know, you know we want to push forward uh, with our CTX-110 as a single administration product that could yield durable responses. Um, and if we need to, we'll interrogate the multi-dosing a redosing aspect at some point um and we'll interrogate you know at, but at this point we're not we have no plans of changing the lymphodepletion um regimen that we're using got it and what have you learned from 110 that can be applied to 120 and the 130 programs yeah i think it's it bodes well for those programs you know the data that we saw with 110 i think you know if if you believe that there's a dose response with these car t's as we get to higher dose levels with 120 and 130, uh, we should hopefully see similar effect, but um, it's still early in those trials. Um, and at this point, you know, 120 obviously, you know, very likely to behave very similar to 110. It's a heme malignancy, um, it's similar construct. 130 has an additional edit on top of 110 over what 110 and 120 have. And um, there's bound to be an effect of the additional edit. So. It'll be interesting to see how 130 behaves in both heme malignancies as well as solid tumors. Yeah. And uh, for these three programs, um, so I, I think you said that you're going to report initial data from 120 BCMA and then 130 CD70 in 2021. Can you talk about uh, what we should be expecting for those initial updates? Yeah, I think, you know, typically our model has been the initial update from the programs are, have been company updates because it's hard to line up the timing always with medical meetings. Um, but, um, you know, and then the subsequent updates are always with, you know, at, at conferences or major medical meetings. So I think we'll follow that paradigm. We'll probably have an update for both 120 and 130. At some point, actually, we haven't said when, and then we'll follow that up with uh, more detailed updates that include all the data on pharmacokinetics um, and the um, further characterization of the CAR-Ts. Got it. And um, maybe for CD70, so you talked about uh, a little bit about that program. Um, I think the, the study looking at solid tumors is really interesting. Uh, maybe if you want to talk about the, the implications of getting this first um, off-the-shelf CAR T to work in solid tumors and longer-term implications of that. Well, I would say more than that. It's the, the first evidence, it would be the first evidence of a CAR T working in solid tumors, right? You know, I think one of the things that we've had with autologous CAR Ts even is they've had very minimal effect in solid tumors because of the tumor microenvironment. And uh, while there's been stray evidence here and there, it's, there hasn't been a, 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 you know, a construct of an autologous CAR T that's shown major impact in solid tumors. And if we can show CD70 allogeneic CAR T having any effect in solid tumors, I, I think that's a major, major milestone, not just for us as a company, but for the entire field of cell therapies. Um, and not surprisingly, there is, you know, a lot of value ascribed to CD70, albeit early in our, in our portfolio around a target that could have major impact, uh, not just from a target standpoint, but from a, uh, from its entirety as a program in opening the door for cell therapies and solid tumors. Got it. And Sam, uh, you've talked a little bit about the uh, collaboration with Biocide. You mentioned that regulatory meetings in the US and EU are ongoing. Any key takes from, from these meetings at this point that you can comment on? No, I think, you know, we've had enough meetings now. You know, typically we don't put out a IND timeline unless we're very confident that we can hit that. Um, and uh, in this case, we've had enough regulatory meetings to understand the requirements, and we believe that we can file an IND next year um, and start clinical trials shortly thereafter. Uh, so the collaboration is going really well. I think 
this isn't type 1 diabetes, but any positive results you may see in type 1 diabetes obviously apply to type 2 diabetes, hence the tremendous interest from all the several, several pharma companies thinking about type 2 diabetes. Um, so we're quite bullish about the program. I think um, um, Viasite in their first generation product have already dosed 15 plus patients and there's data coming from that as well ahead of uh, this Gen 2 version, but the Gen 2 version is could be transformative because you don't need immunosuppression for for patients. Essentially, you're giving a matchstick size implant that's going to go into the body that serves as your artificial pancreas. And that's uh, pretty powerful. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I think it's a key point that this isn't starting from scratch. This is a second gen. And so there's a lot of work that's already out there. Um, well, I think we're out of time. Uh, maybe to close out, if you want to highlight uh, key key events and in, uh, inflection points for CRISPR heading into 2021. Yeah, and uh, yeah, thank you for, again for having us at this conference. Um, you know, bum not to be in London for this, but uh, hopefully next year things are back to normal. Uh, we have you know a number of milestones coming up. I think our data, additional data for 110, new data for 120 and 130, and you know, obviously the most near term thing is additional data at ASH for 001 all position us well in terms of value creation and, and inflection points uh, in our trajectory uh, to become the next gen tech. Awesome. Well, Sam, uh, it's great speaking with you. Thanks again for joining us today.